Well, good evening, and welcome back to another presentation by the Hallelujah Diet. This is an exciting program as we talk to Dr. Levy and, and learn a lot about his research, and uh, we're real excited to have you with us. I'm Paul Malkmus, president of Hallelujah Diet, and um, we're, we're great that you're back with us again this month um, for another presentation. Before we get started, though, I would like to open this up in a word of prayer before um, um, interview or introducing Dr. Levy. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this day, and we thank you for the opportunity to present this information. It's such a time when people are scared and they're they're frightened by all the news and the viruses that are going about. And we know that you created a miraculous body that was prepared actually for things like we're facing now, and we just need to know how to properly care for it. And we just thank you that you've sent Dr. Lee this evening, and we pray that everything goes smoothly with the presentation, and that um, we're able to maintain health as as you desire for us to have. Please uh, bless our evening in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's a real privilege to have Dr. Levy with us and, and he's written several books. He's a board certified cardiologist and a bar certified attorney. After pra practicing adult cardiology for 15 years, he began to research the enormous toxicity associated with much dental work, as well as the pronounced ability of properly administer vitamin C to neutralize this toxicity. He has now written, I think, 13 books with several addressing the wide-ranging properties of vitamin C in neutralizing all toxins and resolving most infections, as well as its vital role in the effective treatment of heart disease and cancer. Recently inducted into the Orthomolecular Medicine Hall of Fame, Dr. Levy continues to research the impact of the orthomolecular application of vitamin C and antioxidants in general on chronic degenerative diseases. He regularly gives lectures on this information at medical conferences around the world, and he has written his most recent book, Rapid Virus Recovery, which was just released uh, this last February. And it's an exciting book. Um, it's a real privilege to have you with us this evening, Dr. Levy. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, Thank you for having me. Uh, very interesting in your little introduction there. It's exactly spot on, and it's not even necessarily religious, so to speak. It's absolutely spot on that everything we're doing is augmenting the body's normal ability to deal with illness, and in this particular case, infection. Uh, I mean, no, nobody ever developed a penicillin deficiency, but many people develop vitamin C and vitamin D deficiencies. So I want to go into the title of, the, of this is Practical Approaches to Acute and Chronic Infections. And I always like to make it clear that during the course of my presentations, every now and then where a fact is clearly documented in the literature, there's a number, the PMID number, PubMed Identifier number, you just take that number Go to this link, it's the PubMed web, uh, website, and put that number in the search box, and you'll go straight to the reference, sometimes the abstract, sometimes the entire article is present, but you'll see what journal was referenced and the authors, etc. Now, I also like in my presentations to try to give you my guide map of where I'm going uh, before I just jump in. So here's more or less the sequence of how we're going to approach things. First of all, I want to talk about literally the cause of all disease. That may sound like a grandiose statement, but I think you'll see as we get into it that that is precisely the case. After that, we go into what promotes chronic disease and what causes the intracellular oxidative stress that is always part of chronic disease presentation. Then we touch upon specific hormones and their impact. And then the big part of it, we're talking about the impact of chronic infection on oxidative stress in general and chronic disease as a result. And something that I think is really a new concept, uh, I'm not aware of it being developed anywhere else, but of chronic pathogen colonization. Now, that's not an acute infection. That's not a disseminated infection. Uh, it's literally turning out to be a primary cause of 
a large amount, likely most oxidative stress that your body has to deal with on a regular basis. Then we'll talk about some practical approaches to dealing with infections, including COVID. And then, interestingly enough, all this will tie into the tremendous pandemic, if you will, of gastrointestinal and gut disease. I mean, you go to the drugstore and they have shelves and shelves and shelves of gastric remedies, diarrhea, constipation, upset stomach, ulcers, you name it. And incredibly enough, we're going to see that there's some things that you can do, very simple, very easy, to literally resolve leaky gut and the abnormal gut microbiome that's always associated with it. Now, <clears throat> literally the cause of all diseases is what we can term increased intracellular oxidative stress, increased IOS. And this is literally, quite simply, when you have an excess number of biomolecules inside the cell in an oxidized rather than a reduced state. Oxidation is electron depletion. Uh, reduction is a restoration of those electrons back to the normal state. <clears throat> we also wrap vitamin C into this whole picture, and it's because the literal essence of redox, reduction oxidation medicine, is really the essence of vitamin C-based biochemistry. Two very important definitions, prooxidant. Prooxidant is a synonym, the same thing as toxin, free radical, reactive oxygen species, poison. All of those things mean the same thing. And in terms of their impact on the body, they all take or cause to be taken electrons away from reduced, which are normal biomolecules. This is called oxidation. The flip side of that coin is the antioxidant, of which vitamin C is the prototype, but by no means uh, the only antioxidant of importance in your body or in your diet or in your supplementation. And an antioxidant gives or restores electrons back to oxidized biomolecules so that they resume an electrically normal biochemical configuration. Now, because of this, and this is covered extensively in the literature, although not in the medical textbooks, I won't go into why on that, except to say that it's been very clearly established that vitamin C, especially when you dose it correctly, dose it highly, in high multigram forms, often intravenously, is the ultimate effective antitoxin for all toxins. This is because the toxins do their damage by taking electrons away from molecules and putting them in an inactive oxidized state. When you have the right antioxidants in the right place in the cell near the molecules that have been oxidized, they can donate the electrons back and, if you will, restore the biomolecule back to life. This has been shown in the test tube and in 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 uh, the in, in the animal itself, animals, humans, and even in plants, in many clinical studies. So there's a lot of talk about toxins these days, oxidative stress. I can't emphasize strongly enough that the only thing that's toxic to you is something that causes you to lose electrons from a select group of biomolecules. If a given molecule does not cause the loss of one or more molecules from another molecule, it simply is not toxic and it has no toxic effect as we know. Or if you prefer the phraseology, it has no poisonous capacity. Toxicity and any symptoms of toxicity cannot exist in the absence of excess oxidation of biomolecules. So, this might seem to be a small point I'm going to make here, but I consider it to be a very big point. 
the literature and the textbooks all talk about oxidative stress causing disease, being associated with disease. That's close to accurate. But what's the most accurate statement is all disease is the state of oxidation. The more biomolecules in different locations, in different concentrations, in different tissues, the state of oxidation is the disease. There's no additional disease process going on in an Alzheimer's cell or a coronary artery disease cell or a fibromyalgia cell. The only differences are the distribution, concentration of biomolecules that are oxidized and how long they've been oxidized. That determines toxicity. When I say biomolecules, I mean just about everything of significance inside the cell. Nucleic acids, proteins, enzymes, very important. I mean, when you oxidize an enzyme and keep it from functioning, you really magnify the impact of that particular oxidation. Sugars and fats as well. And so underlined here is the important point to remember. When a biomolecule is oxidized, it is less active but more commonly inactive. So that particular biomolecule is not going to chemically interact correctly or at all with other biomolecules. When on the other hand, you can re-donate and restore the electron status to those biomolecules, it becomes once again optimally active and normal. So normalcy and abnormalcy at the molecular level is simply oxidation or reduction. So the unique nature of any disease process depends solely on how many biomolecules are oxidized, where are they located, where are they concentrated, how long have they been oxidized. So this is an important concept to keep in mind as we go forward in the rest of the presentation. So <clears throat> with the concept of what causes disease in mind, this leads us to the concept of what factors promote chronic degenerative diseases. Well, we just said that all diseases are caused by excess biomolecule oxidation. So it follows that the prominent promoters of those diseases will be those diseases that produce, promote, or disseminate toxic substances. Number one on the list, infections, endotoxins, exotoxins, uh, oxidized metabolic byproducts, mostly dental or oral in, in location, okay? Uh, you can have focal infections anywhere in the body, and uh, an infected toenail can cause you a lot of problems, an infected appendix, an infected gallbladder, but statistically speaking, what determines what's going on in the disease process in most people is coming from their mouth. Now, number two, chronic pathogen colonization, particularly in what we call the aerodigestive tract. That's uh, the esophagus and above. Below the esophagus is the gastrointestinal tract. So in the aerodigestive tract, you have the sinus, mouth, pharynx, upper respiratory tract. These all chronically colonize microbes. When everything is fine, it's what you call a normal flora. However, what happens when you get a cold is even when you get over the cold, you leave behind pathogens coated on the mucosa that replicate slowly and are covered up by biofilms and stay indefinitely. And I'll talk more about this in a moment. Other causes are any known outside toxin exposures. You know, if you live next to a fertilizer plant, hey, that's going to be a big source of toxicity for you. Number four, toxic iron status, <clears throat> also calcium and copper. Iron, calcium, and copper are what I term the three toxic nutrients. You can't live without a minimal amount of them, and you're going to die with too much of them. 
all three of these figure strongly into how cells eventually uh, auto-kill themselves uh, in, in terms of um, – the terms are sl uh, slipping me, but where you either have a cell rupture or you have an internal cellular collapse. And this is caused and precipitated prominently by these three toxic nutrients. Now, at the lower level, you absolutely need them, <laughs> but you don't ever need to supplement them. Then there are dietary toxic exposures. We talk a lot about food enrichment. Guess what enrichment is? A lot of iron. It does not need to be in your food, and it's nothing but poisonous. So this is probably one of the major advantages of the gluten-free or the organic diet is because generally, not 100%, generally they don't enrich organic food and they don't enrich and add other stuff to gluten-free food. But boy, do they like to put it in everything else. And <clears throat> it's beyond the scope of this talk, but it generally is added in the form of, believe it or not, metallic iron filings. So if you want to be thoroughly amazed and disgusted, go to YouTube and type in Dr. Levy Iron Video, and you'll see what I'm talking about. The digestive, digestive itself is vital that it be balanced and take place in the appropriate period of time. When you slow the gut down, like with poor food combining, food stagnates and putrefies. So the longer your time between bowel movements, the more gut toxicity you have. And believe it or not, a perfect diet, poorly digested, is going to be far more toxic to you than a relatively harm, horrible selection of foods, but well digested. Finally, hormone deficiencies, and I'll go into that. Sex hormones, thyroid hormone. Now, I mentioned earlier, intracellular, that's inside the cell, intracellular oxidative stress, what impacts this all-important parameter? I say that all-important because if the IOS is not elevated, there is no disease or pathology. So whenever you have a, a disease cell or a cell that's part of the disease process of a given tissue, the inside of those cells have increased oxidative stress or an increased ratio of oxidized to reduced biomolecules. And the primary determinants of this are the intracellular levels of calcium, magnesium, vitamin C, and glutathione. In the case of calcium, and I wrote another book on this subject called Death by Calcium, which I assure you is not an exaggeration in the title, uh, and uh, anyone who wants can send me an email and I'll give you a link to download a copy of that book if you like because there's a lot of data in there, a lot of studies. This is not just some off-the-cuff crazy stuff I'm trying to pass along to you. The intracellular calcium concentration is the primary determinant of increased intracellular oxidative stress. The higher it goes, the higher the stress. When it comes down to normal levels, and I say normal levels because normal physiology generates some oxidation. So you can't eliminate oxidation completely from your body, and you don't want to. So I'm, when I say level is normal, I'm saying normal levels of oxidative stress. When that's the case, the cell physiology is in a normal state. Because of this, the manipulation of intracellular calcium levels appears to be the most straightforward way to positively impact IOS, thereby positively impacting whatever diseases you're talking about. And here's a couple studies that show you how toxic and bad for you calcium is, how it increases all-cause mortality. Calcium supplementation by itself has been shown to increase the risk of heart attacks. So let me tell you, there's a lot of things you can do for osteoporosis, and none of them are supplementing calcium. Do not supplement calcium. It's a primary carcinogen. Magnesium. Magnesium is the yin and the yang with calcium. When calcium levels are high, magnesium levels are low, and as magnesium goes into the cell, calcium comes out. Because of this, 
Magnesium is actually a natural calcium channel blocker and a general calcium channel, calcium metabolism antagonist. And this is the reason that magnesium is such an incredibly important thing to supplement regularly with substantial doses because a magnesium deficiency, which unfortunately most people have to a greater or lesser degree, and you want to supplement to the point that is to a lesser degree, magnesium deficiency causes many diseases, and this is the important part, makes all diseases worse, okay? So the primary way to manipulate intracellular calcium is by getting as much magnesium in as possible. The magnesium goes into the cell, displaces the calcium, oxidative stress comes down. And as we see at the bottom of the slide, more magnesium decreases all-cause mortality. All-cause mortality means your chance of death from anything. So for it to decrease your chance of death from anything means it's affecting a critical parameter that's present in all the cells of your body, not just the cells affected in one disease. Vitamin C, the goal is always to get normal levels of vitamin C inside the cell. But it's never going to happen when the calcium levels are high and the magnesium levels are low. Good vitamin C supplementation and other things we'll talk about does help uh, decrease the intracellular oxidative stress, but the main thing that has to take place first is to get the calcium down and get the magnesium up. And low vitamin C inside the cell in every sense of the word is actually intracellular scurvy. Glutathione. <clears throat> Do we talk about this a lot? And an it's extremely critical, important um, <clears throat> entity to have inside your cells. And in fact, as we see in the top line of this slide, it is the most concentrated and physiologically important of intracellular antioxidants because it activates important enzymes and keeps the uh, oxidative stress minimized inside the cell when it's able to be synthesized. Now, what did I mention earlier? I mentioned increased oxidative stress is going to oxidize enzymes. When you oxidize an enzyme, which is a biomolecule, you impair it or you inactivate it. With this means then that there's no way for you to naturally synthesize enough glutathione inside your cells as long as the oxidative stress is elevated and many of those enzymes are oxidized. So once again, uh, there are some things you can do that will help glutathione levels inside the cell a little bit, but the main importance is, once again, back to minimizing calcium and maximizing magnesium. Then the vitamin C levels and the glutathione levels via glutathione synthesis come into play. Now, this slide is strictly my concept, Okay. Uh, I presented to you that I consider hormones conceptually to have just two main purposes. Number one, they positively modulate and accelerate some aspect of normal metabolism, different, different hormones, different things. Number two, they all, in the course of performing their function, help work to minimize, minimize and even normalize any increases in intracellular oxidative stress. Probably your most important hormones, and especially with regard to this impact on intracellular oxidative stress, are insulin, hydrocortisone, thyroid hormone, and the testosterone and estrogen. Now, Vitamin C and magnesium actually work to do the same things as hormones, but I'm not saying they are hormones. They're not, but they functionally work to decrease oxidative stress as well. Okay. So, getting more into the clinical, remember that the goal of all effective clinical protocols is to normalize the increased oxidative stress that is characteristic of all disease cells and therefore all medical conditions. Once you achieve that, that particular cell no longer is diseased. And obviously, if enough of its fellow cells are not diseased, 
then you no longer have a clinical disease. You always want to aim to get vitamin C levels normal inside the cell, but bear in mind that high doses of vitamin C alone will not accomplish this. Although, if you do nothing else, supplementing vitamin C is going to help a lot. And if you just supplement one other thing, magnesium, you're doing two of the big things. I consider the most important supplements as baseline for any supplement regimen to be magnesium, vitamin C, vitamin D, and vitamin K. All four of these supplements have had studies performed where it shows that that supplement by itself decreases all-cause mortality. And this is because each one of those four things that I mentioned positively impacts and helps to normalize intracellular calcium levels. So I don't think you can get much better than a supplement that decreases your chance of death from anything. Now, so the critical factors that you need to address, you need optimal levels of the critical hormones. Very importantly, you need to eliminate infections or, and I'm going to talk about this in a moment, contain them. Keep focal infections focal. Number three, magnesium intracellularly. Number four, optimal digestion. Number five, optimal additional supplementation. Now, back in the 1970s, as a Dr. Broda Barnes, <clears throat> who worked with roughly 1,500 different adult patients, they were general population patients, they had diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, even cancer, some many of the other diseases. He wasn't selecting them in any particular capacity other than the fact that he was specializing in low thyroid and identified these patients as being low in thyroid. And he developed his protocol for treating this. Now, the important thing to remember is infections cause all disease, usually by chronic pathogen colonization. In the case of coronary artery disease, coronary artery disease is completely a chronic pathogen colonization of the arterial wall with mouth and periodontal pathogens. Dr. Ott in 2006 took specimens of 38 plaques by angiography out of 38 patients by a process called atherectomy. And he found over 50 different oral pathogens inside those plaques, and he found them in 38 out of 38 patients, pretty close to 100%. That was sarcasm. So the point being is you don't develop atherosclerosis until you have chronic focal colonization in the coronary artery, consuming all the vitamin C in that coronary artery, causing an inflammation, which then mobilizes the immune system to start an immune reaction. And unless you stop the daily new pathogens coming in, that chronic inflammation becomes the disease and accelerates the atherosclerosis. <clears throat> Dr. Barnes found in his 1,500 patients over the course of 20 years with all the different diseases that I mentioned, dental toxicity, root canals, you name it, four of them had heart attacks. And he found that those four probably had needed more thyroid to normalize the thyroid function. That's four out of 1,500. Now, consider this in the context that the Framingham study, which looked at mortality in populations, determined that a population of that size should have had 80 heart attacks over the course of 20 years, not four, and certainly not three, two, one, or zero. This is because thyroid hormone is probably your single most important regulator of oxidative stress inside your cells. Thyroid function by itself just not just emanate from the thyroid gland, although it seems to be that's the common consideration. Regular thyroid tests only reliably detect hyperthyroidism and severe or advanced <clears throat> hypothyroidism 
but not the minimal hypothyroidism that I believe the vast majority of the population have. The importance of this also comes into play when you realize that the active form of thyroid hormone is T3. Thyroid T4 gets formed inside the thyroid gland, but it's basically a precursor hormone. It's not until it's formed and cleaved off an iodine and you make T3 that you have active thyroid function. Well, only 15 to 20% of this T4 to T3 conversion takes place inside the thyroid gland, and the rest occurs in all the cells throughout the body. So you literally have trillions of thyroid glands, not just one big one. Diiodinases take off these iodines, and when you get too much oxidative stress, these diiodinases become oxidized, and you start forming more of what's called reverse T3 rather than regular T3. And this is important. I don't think they had it in Dr. Barnes's days. He had to use other clinical ways to treat his patients. But we now have the free T3 and the reverse T3 ratio. It should be 18 to 1 to 20 to 1 or even slightly higher. But as soon as you start getting down into 16, 15, 14, 13 to 1, you're dealing with substantial increased oxidative stress throughout your body, which is not only going to allow any focal infections you haven't eradicated to metastasize, it also helps cancers metastasize as well. So no matter what type of patient you're treating, it's very, very, very important to regulate thyroid function as tightly as possible. This is a little worksheet that shows in one particular patient how you come to the numbers that we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> supplementing vitamin C is very important. Part of this, I want to emphasize that, and of course I already said how important other supplements are, but I want to emphasize that it's important if you have the availability to have quality liposome encapsulated because this gets you intracellular access of the vitamin C without the consumption of energy, which is something that even intravenous vitamin C can't do. Intravenous vitamin C in the blood needs to consume energy to get inside the cell. <clears throat> There's also multi-gram doses of sodium ascorbate powder. This helps minimize gut toxicity. You get it right in the gut and it starts to neutralize toxins on contact. Ascorbyl palmitate, it gives you fat-soluble access of the ascorbate. Of course, there's IV, and there's many different IV combinations, and we're using them with insulin, hydrocortisone, magnesium, you name it. What's come to the fore most recently is when you're dealing with treating a vitamin C depleting condition, most things, or most of them are, but when it's sepsis, it's very significant, is rather than give one large dose of vitamin C, say 50 grams one time as an infusion per day, which is good, fantastic, but it's not as good as 10 grams every six hours. So if you gave slightly less vitamin C but spread it over the clock, you're going to have a better impact than if you give the one big infusion. Of course, the one big infusion has evolved because hospitals still won't give vitamin C, so somebody comes to a clinical office, they can't get vitamin C every six hours, so they get the one big infusion. Intramuscular is also good. And also, we now have some agents that, believe it or not, promote and sustain vitamin C in the plasma, which is effectively a reversal or almost complete reversal of an acquired epigenetic deficiency, not an abnormality in the DNA coding. Most animals make their own vitamin C by synthesizing it from glucose in their livers. For enzyme sequence, glucose turns into vitamin C. Well, humans are normally deficient in the fourth enzyme and appear not to make it. We have agents, polyphenols, that appear to reverse this and give you the capacity to synthesize your own vitamin C on demand, which is very exciting. Now, let's 
dig down into chronic pathogen colonization. Infections, pathogens present body-wide, present focal and concentrated, like with infected teeth, and then as broader areas over mucosal or epithelial surfaces. And remember with the, the, the third category, these, as soon as they've been on the mucosal or epithelial surface for more than 24 hours, they start building biofilms, which make them absolutely resistant and refractory to antibiotic therapy. So, when you have this going on in your aerodigestive tract, sinus, nose, throat, think what you're doing. As the pathogens proliferate, they shed, and you swallow pathogens. You swallow the toxins that the pathogens produce. You swallow the pro-oxidant metabolic byproducts that they produce. And when they finally break down, you swallow a large amount of free iron because iron causes pathogens to proliferate in this highly concentrated in iron. So normal swallowing 24-7 when you have this chronic pathogen colonization, which most people do, this makes the maintenance of a normal gut flora virtually impossible until you eradicate and keep eradicated that CPC. As I mentioned, once you get the CBC, unless you do a significant measure that strips away biofilm and then kills pathogens, you're going to keep it for years or for life, okay? Just like people keep gastrointestinal disorders for life, okay? So it all comes together when you consider the fact that gut disorders are chronic only really because What's causing them is chronically afflicting them. In the small intestine, where you have leaky gut syndrome, those cells replicate every three, four, five days. So less than every week, you have a brand new set of cells. Well, why don't you have then normal gut function and no more leaky gut since you brought in new cells? You don't because... Each day, 24-7, you're swallowing these pathogens and toxins, keeping the oxidative stress in the epithelial barrier high, allowing it to leak and cause the leaky gut syndrome. I mentioned this earlier, the air digestive tract or sinuses, nasal and oral pharynx, even the tonsils, the tongue and the esophagus, and also the lining of the lungs. A lot of docs, a lot of people think the lungs are sterile. Not at all. They're not sterile at all, but they do have a normal microbiome, uh, and the cells actually synthesize and secrete hydrogen peroxide to help maintain that normal microbiome from being overrun by pathogens. And so that leads into this slide. There's effectively no prescription medication, zero, nada, that will destroy a biofilm and then kill the previously protected pathogens. And although it's not the only agent that will do this, hydrogen peroxide is very effective in doing both of these functions and not requiring a great deal of time or concentration to do it. So, once you eradicate chronic pathogen colonization with the nebulization of peroxide that I'm going to talk about, You need to regularly scrape the tongue, which harbors lots of pathogens. Temporary probiotics. Really, once you stop poisoning the gut, the gut doesn't need any extra bugs added to it. It starts to replicate its own normal microbiome all on its own. And you have to eliminate chronic oral cavity infections, and this includes infected gums, periodontitis, infected teeth, root canal, silent abscesses, chronically infected tonsils, and chronically infected sinuses. Nebulization converts a liquid agent into a fine mist. You inhale this, and it mobilizes mucus and secretions, which is always good for any disorder. You allow a direct contact of the agent with the pathogens. This is critical because you can use, as it shows in number three, much lower doses than had to be administered systemically in order to get a concentration where you need it. 
a lot of people ask, you know, how do I use it? What about babies? Well, I just want to say any acute viral respiratory syndrome, including our horrible pandemic, can readily be addressed with nebulized hydrogen peroxide. 3% is best. If you can tolerate it, I give the better, higher concentration you get when you have an infection, the better and quicker the response. But some people are sensitive, so you can dilute down until you reach a concentration, dilute down the peroxide with saline solution until you reach a tolerable level. Like I said, many people tolerate 3%. Many people, you have to go down to 1% or 0.5%. And they say, what about the babies? Hey, the babies and the infants and the toddlers need it as much or more than anybody else. You just need to be prepared to suction out the mucus since they don't really cough up mucus and they can't really blow their nose. Once you get used to hydrogen peroxide nebulization, you develop your own health quotient, if you will. You sort of begin to detect when you're down or when something's developing in the nose and throat, and you can do it as needed. On the other hand, I'm getting a lot of feedback from a lot of people that they really do well when they do some of it every day, okay, maybe three, four minutes, five minutes, because this keeps the aerodigestive tract clean. It keeps the gut from being contaminated. It keeps the proximal gut from leaky, leaky gut syndrome. And it's just a tremendous therapy that helps in a lot of different ways. Now, let me say that uh, <clears throat> when I first started working with hydrogen peroxide nebulization, and I wrote some articles on it, uh, I knew it would knock out any virus, and I knew intuitively it was going to knock out COVID too. But I didn't have the clear-cut evidence. Well, I left the nebulizer with a friend two years ago in Cali, Colombia, there I have a lot of family and friends down there. And this was before the pandemic started. Uh, I gave it to her because she was having a problem with a cold. And after we cleared her cold up, she said, well, my family has a lot of problems too. I said, keep it. I gave her the nebulizer. I gave her the hydrogen peroxide. Now look at this. 20 out of 20 advanced COVID cases. What do I mean by advanced? significant respiratory difficulty. If you have COVID and you have trouble breathing, you're close to the end of your rope, okay? Now, we didn't have vitamin C down there. We didn't have ozone. We didn't have all of the other good stuff, the ivermectin, the hydroxychloroquine, the chloroquine, you name it. All that was available was the hydrogen peroxide. So she started these 20 patients on 30 minutes of nebulization three times a day for five days. This completely cured the COVID cases in all 20 patients. Point being is so I, the hydrogen peroxide nebulization can and will and has functioned as a monotherapy. And if we're going to knock out this pandemic around the world, we need something that everybody has access to. As wonderful and easy as they are to access for us here in the States, most people can't get a hold of vitamin C. Most people cannot get ozone therapy. Uh, most people cannot get the prescription drugs that they need, the ivermectin, the hydroxychloroquine, but they can get a hold of hydrogen peroxide. And that's why, and since we now know that peroxide will work as a monotherapy, add anything to it that you can get a hold of by no means should you limit yourself to nebulization once you feel you're getting sick or you have someone who is sick. But remember this, the nebulization is not contraindicated in any condition. It simply augments whatever else you're doing with regard to achieving a positive clinical effect. Some factoids about peroxide, like we're talking about nature, God, it's the body's all-purpose antibiotic antipathogen. The body produces it in all the cells, inside and outside. 
It diffuses everywhere. It's very stable, unlike a lot of people believe. It's not highly reactive until you put in the presence of the pathogen. It has no toxicity when properly administered. And this is important because we accept so much with our doctors at our hospitals. But be aware that 100,000 people a year in the United States die from pharmaceutical agents that are properly dosed and administered. We're not talking overdoses, anything like that. We're talking given properly, given recommended, they kill 100,000 people a year. What else about hydrogen peroxide? Byproducts. It leaves behind water and oxygen. This means it not only kills the pathogens, but it leaves behind in the previously infected area and damaged tissue an oxygenated and hydrated state, which is the ideal environment for the rapid and complete healing of the tissue that was promoted, uh, that was uh, damaged by the infection. Also, roughly 5% of every breath you take, that oxygen is converted and stored in hydrogen peroxide inside your body. Uh, and when you nebulize peroxide, if you have an oximeter, you'll see over the course of a minute or two, across the board, your reading go up two to three points. It's probably a good substitute if you don't have nasal oxygen available when it's critical. Hydrogen peroxide nebulization will immediately increase the oxygen content in your blood. It's naturally present in the urine. It's naturally present, number nine, in the cells that line the airways and the lungs. So the body is already using hydrogen peroxide to naturally try to eliminate any new pathogens that come in with each breath. Hydrogen peroxide and vitamin C turns out are physiological partners. They really work together. I mentioned pathogens thrive on iron. We have something called the Fenton reaction. Vitamin C goes into the cell, donates an electron to Fe2+, plus, uh, Fe3+, plus to make it 2+, plus, and then from that Fe2+, plus, the hydrogen peroxide receives that electron and breaks down to an incredibly potent oxidizing agent called a hydroxyl radical. And when you get hydroxyl radical levels high, it oxidizes and destroys everything, and you rupture the cell and kill the virus. Now, vitamin C is especially important because it not only fuels this all-important reaction, it also sustains the reaction by keeping all three parts of the reaction inadequate levels. I mean, when you have a reaction and you run out of substrate, the reaction stops. Well, the vitamin C continues to supply electrons. Uh, it continues to supply hydrogen peroxide because, incredibly enough, vitamin C massively upregulates extracellular hydrogen peroxide production, which goes into the cell and continues to break down to hydroxyl radical. And the hydrogen peroxide, once it gets inside the cell, mobilizes new iron from storage sites, the ferritin. So that way, the initial high dose of vitamin C, this is why high dose vitamin C is so profoundly effective against infections. It kills via the FET reaction, and because of the interactions that I just mentioned, it keeps the FET reaction going as long as you're giving the vitamin C so that you go to completion of eliminating the pathogen that you're dealing with. Uh, in viruses and in COVID, the sooner the better. If you can know that you're getting a sniffy, runny nose, an itch, something that you know in you has always preceded a cold or flu before, and you jump on it with a peroxide nebulization, you should be completely well in 24 hours, and you should be asymptomatic after four or five hours. When, it's the, when the viral count is low but present, and you know that it's present, peroxide nebulization literally chops the head off the viral snake. And the body can then proceed to mop up the viral presence elsewhere in the body without worrying about new virus coming in and reseeding every area in the body. So, 
hydrogen peroxide and viruses to sort of encapsulate it. The nebulization of hydrogen peroxide, number one, augments the body's natural production. Number two, delivers it precisely where it's needed the most. Number three, completely non-toxic. Number four, hydrates and oxygenates. Number five, increases improved blood oxygen. And, of course, it's readily available around the world. It's inconsequentially inexpensive. You don't need a doctor or a clinic or a hospital to give it. And one nebulizer can serve an entire community. And one bottle of hydrogen peroxide for $1 can treat 100 people. So I mentioned that early onset does the best. When you dilute, dilute is best done with a saline solution. Basic rule of thumb on infections, continue whatever treatment, peroxide nebulization included, that you're doing for a given infection, but continue it for at least 24 and preferably 48 hours after you have what you feel is a complete normalization inside your body or inside the patient, patient's body. Uh, this is to make sure the infection gets knocked out completely but doesn't smolder and bounce back. So I maintain you never need to suffer from a cold or pneumonia or influenza again, and let me tell you, there's no need to suffer with COVID. Uh, we, we have the evidence now, to my satisfaction, that shows that hydrogen peroxide nebulization is indicated at any stage of COVID and not that you don't want to do as many other things as you can, but it's thoroughly capable of salvaging patients that are already in advanced respiratory difficulty by itself. Um, some people note that with the mask, a little, little of the peroxide irritates their eyes. Hey, look, adjust your mask, nebulize in front of a fan, but you do want to avoid chronically irritating your eyes. It's not the same situation as chronically irritating or overshooting and ir uh, causing a roughness of the mucosa after you kill all the pathogens. That resolves properly. The eyes resolve properly too, but you just don't want to chronically uh, inflame or cause any sort of oxidative stress to your eyes. Nebulizers. Here's the models. I shouldn't say model. That's the style. This is a laptop, a tabletop model. It's your best bet for durability and longevity and allowing yourself an unlimited number of treatments, easy to maintain. It's really just an air pump, okay? The action is inside the little nebulizer cone. All this is doing is just is pushing air, and then so it goes through the solution and pushes it and makes it to a fine mist. There's a handheld these are fine, they work great, but they're delicate, they break down easy, but they're a good option to have if you're traveling or if you want to be moving around with your nebulizer rather than just sitting in one space. And so that concludes this. I want you to see these two links. I encourage you to get uh, the free uh, downloads, PDF downloads of rapid virus recovery and hidden epidemics. Okay, uh, this is my website. There's a lot of articles there as well. This is my email address. Let me say ahead of time, I've always made my email address public for 20 years now. I cannot offer consultations, but when somebody uh, has read my materials and has a good question, a misunderstanding, or a desire for a clarification, I can address those questions or I can point you in the direction where to get additional help. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Levy. That was absolutely incredible. And um, a plug for, for your book, um, Rapid Virus Recovery. Um, when I saw that we were doing the, the interview on, on with you, um, I bought your book. And I have to say it absolutely tied several things together for me that um, I've seen over the years that I didn't have an answer to and especially how the microbiome and the CPC and how it all relate to the gut, related to the gut um, and the microbiome. Let, let me really say this. I, I didn't have a chance to cover it during the presentation, but I came upon its infect on the gut, 
two years ago when I first did it for my chronic sinus and throat problems I'd had all my life. I was 68 at the time. And it started clearing that up. But what I noted after my first hydrogen peroxide nebulization, the next morning, I had the most incredibly perfectly formed bowel movement of my life. And it just <laughs> didn't make sense until I started thinking about it. Then I said, wow, you're just poisoning your gut on a regular basis with stuff that you swallow. And I even had somebody just today, a 75-year-old fellow, write me and say, thanks, Doc. Uh, my cough is gone. My runny nose is gone. My hemorrhoids are gone. <laughs> and, I had a, and I'm having, in his words, museum-quality bowel movements. Well, I've never seen a bowel movement in a museum, but I think I got the idea. <laughs> Well, well, we've been looking at ozone and and utilizing ozone and seeing some good results with that. But this just kind of really turned the light on, light switch on for me um, in how the the mouth health and the dental health, um, the dental foci. Most people don't understand that at all. Can can you explain that, um, and so people can understand what dental foci is? Yeah, that's in detail in the second book available for download, Hidden Epidemic. Uh, in a nutshell, this is a generalization, but a good one. Nobody gets sick if they have a normal mouth. If they have normal gums, normal teeth, no root canals, normal tonsils, normal sinuses, they're well. Trouble is, most adults don't. And not only are all root canals infected, yes, 100%, they're always associated with infected gums, which has been shown in the literature to be associated with and likely causative for just about every disease imaginable because it allows the dissemination of pathogens and toxins throughout the body to colonize and make chronic pathogen colonization in the tissues just like they do in the throat. And then the tonsils become easily trashed when they're draining these infections and they need to be addressed as well. But the real important message of the Hidden Epidemic book is the vast majority of adults, certainly just about everybody with a chronic disease, has one or more abscessed tooth, abscessed teeth that are asymptomatic. They feel fine. And you cannot know that those teeth are present until you do what's known as a 3D cone beam examination of the mouth. It's my highest recommendation that that's a part of baseline evaluation right along with the CBC and the biochem panel and the lipids and the thyroid function, that should be part of the baseline uh, evaluation because it just so profoundly impacts disease. And as it's mentioned on the title, it is the single greatest cause of heart attacks and breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And do you have a resource for finding um, a dentist that's able to do the, the scan, the CT scan? Uh, yeah, th those are resources are in the book, but I'll say right up, up front is that uh, the use of this machine has proliferated rapidly in the last 10 years, okay? So most high-volume dentists, general dentists have it, but nearly all dentists who specialize in implants have it, okay? Because it's okay. just about dental malpractice now not to be able to map out the 3D anatomy of the bone structure before you start putting implants in. So, so it's, 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 you know, and all it takes is a phone call. You, you find a dentist you want to see and then give, a phone, give him or her a phone call. Do you have this machine? Oh, no, you don't. Can you tell me somebody uh, near your office that has one? No problem. Yep. Oh, that's awesome. Um, just a couple more questions. Um, Hashimoto's and um, Epstein-Barr virus, um, any, do you have any connection between the um, CPC and EPV, EBV? Yeah, I think they're strongly connected. The thing is, is uh, most of these chronic viral and other diseases, we got the bug by having an abnormal microbiome in a leaky gut. In many people, when you resolve and normalize the microbiome and tighten up and heal the leaky gut and stop supplying new pathogens throughout the body, 
Like Dr. Huggins told me many years ago, you can't dry off while you're still in the shower. So often we just try to improve the situation, but we don't do the things to stop what's continuing to provoke it on a daily basis. A lot of people like that will resolve. And many people who have uh, the indices of fungi in their urine will resolve. Okay, I've seen that many times too. Uh, We've seen individuals with, um, I I think, I don't have the evidence yet, that we'll be able to see when people start doing this on a regular basis that most gluten sensitivity will disappear because gluten is just another protein that if you keep it in the GI tract, you dissolve it into amino acids, no big deal. But when you let chunks of the protein or the whole protein leak leak by the gut into the lymph and into the blood supply, you get antigenic reactions and all the diseases that we know about associated with that. Uh, The other thing about Hashimoto's is I like to say, where is the thyroid gland sitting? Right below (laughs) all these dental infections and dental toxicity. It's literally a drain for all the toxins you're producing 24-7 in your mouth. Once again, uh, Dr. Huggins found many years ago that people with elevated anti-nuclear antibody, those are the tests for autoimmune disease, very high titers, and when they come in over a two-week period, get all the toxins, mercury, and infections taken out, get on a diet, get on proper supplements, that level would drop dramatically and oftentimes normalize. But in most patients, with most doctors, they're considered chronic conditions because nobody addresses the mouth. The evidence I'm talking about is in the mainstream literature. On the heart, it's in the cardiac literature in circulation of all places, I humbly and personally consider it malpractice to manage a heart patient to any degree at all and not see that they get the 3D cone beam examination. Obviously, the same thing with breast cancer as well. Yep, that absolutely makes sense. Um, One last question, and we appreciate your time so much, but um, what would you um, nebulize besides the um, hydrogen peroxide? What are, what are things that you found extremely beneficial for that? Well, uh, lots of things. Dilute solutions of sodium bicarb, which uh, has an alkalinizing effect, which sometimes uh, impacts certain bugs and fungi more readily than, than the peroxide. Uh, nebulizing uh, DMSO with and without vitamin C and magnesium chloride because the DMSO can help push the vitamin C and the magnesium chloride into the cell, bringing down the intracellular oxidative stress in those respiratory epithelial cells. And many other things. Iodine, there's, uh, there's uh, and I cover some of these examples in the book, but there's many different options. I just go by the rule of thumb is, you know, try to use a little analysis of what am I trying to do, what am I trying to accomplish, and first and first and foremost, make sure whatever you nebulize is easily tolerated. And not only easy tolerated, the, the best thing is when you start nebulizing it, it's relaxing. So if you're doing something like that, uh, it's very unlikely you're going to run into any problems, but definitely um, uh you don't uh, nebulize a lot of oils. Uh, they tend to they tend to stay put in the lungs rather than demobilize like water soluble things. But many many different options. I've probably nebulized a hundred different combinations in the last two years. <laughs> and if somebody does have a like a cough after nebulizing, um, let's say hydrogen peroxide, um, would they nebulize vitamin C um, and magnesium maybe? Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, the, my my go-to for that is uh, a combination of magnesium chloride and sodium ascorbate uh, with just uh, uh, maybe uh, 5 or 10% of uh, DMSO added to it. And I found personally that when my throat is aggravated, that settles it down pretty quick. That's awesome. That's great. Well, we sure appreciate your time and all your – I could ask you questions all day long. You're such a wealth of information. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking your time. Um, any, any last message for the audience before we go this evening? 
Well, in general, uh, I like to tell people that, and probably most people in, in your group and listening to this are maybe already along these lines, but you really need to be your own active consumer and be your own active uh, advocate, okay? Most people, sad to say, they get sick, they just pick a doctor and say, here I am, do what you need to do. And more often than not, I'm afraid, you're not going to get taken care of very well. Uh, you need to have a physician, healthcare practitioner who welcomes, not is intolerant by your questions, willing to discuss things. If you have people that want to push you out of their office quick, I say don't walk out, run out. So you need to be your own advocate. Uh, and the only other thing, too, is <laughs> this is sad, but it's true. There's so much lying and outright fraudulent information not only in medicine, but everywhere else, that when you do come across what you consider to be a wonderful option for whatever it is you're dealing with, reconfirm it with at least three or four different sources approaching it from a different angle. That way you sort of eliminate somebody either advocating for something or against something because it's in their best interest. Mm-hmm. No, that that's awesome advice, I mean, and we thank you so much for it. And thank you so much for taking the time this evening to to share this this uh, wealth of information. It's an actually incredible. Uh, I I can't wait to read more of your book. I I don't have the hidden epidemic yet, but it falls right in line with some things um, that we've been looking at. So, um, thank you again for joining us this evening, and thank you everyone for joining us. We'll be back next month with another presentation, and until then, we pray that you'll stay in good health. Thank you and have a great evening. Okay. Thank you. Take care.